Walter, your group has joined some congressional Democrats calling for the DOJ to investigate Thomas for his non-disclosures. In a filing today, you wrote, circumstances surrounding the concealment of these reportable items strongly support the conclusion that these violations of the law were knowing and willful. What are the circumstances you're referring to? You know, one of the biggest circumstances is that Justice Thomas disclosed these kind of items before until an embarrassing 2004 article came out in the L.A. Times, and then he stopped disclosing them. Then there's the fact that the law is absolutely clear on this. None of this is ambiguous, contrary to what he and his defenders would have you think. And then there's simply the fact that other justices have disclosed these kinds of things. And then a final circumstance is that Every one of the four supervising ethics offices in the government, one for each branch and two in the Congress, have issued very plain guidance on all of this. Uh, so there's no excuse for Justice Thomas to not have known. It's not plausible that he didn't know that these were disclosable. Michael, let's, let's talk about the history here. The Ethics in Government Act, it was passed in the aftermath of the Watergate scandal in 78. Right. What reporting requirements did that law institute for judges? And, and I, I guess the even bigger question, 45 years later, are they enough? Uh, they're not enough. And as we have seen, you know, he, you're, it depended on the fact that Supreme Court justices would be honorable enough to report big financial transactions. You know, uh, Clarence Thomas is on a government salary. This real estate deal is, what, $133,000 plus? He has taken millions of dollars in trips and other favors from Harlan Crow over two decades. These are not small amounts of money. And for him to claim that he didn't think this was important enough to put in his disclosure, that just defies credibility. This well, is corrupt. This is the guy who's supposedly making moral judgments on the Supreme Court uh, about every other American's behavior. Walter, well, I want to read you something from The Washington Post reporting on another potential disclosure mishap by Thomas that he's for years claimed income from a defunct real estate firm. The Post says that the error, regardless of whether it was a simple paperwork error, raises questions about how seriously Thomas views his responsibility to accurately report his finances to the public. What's your response to that, Walter? Yeah, I think they're absolutely right, because we don't know exactly what went on with the name change of that company or, or whether he dissolved it and created another one. But it's part of a much larger pattern. And that's the problem, is that Justice Thomas keeps forgetting conveniently that things are reportable. In 2011, he had to go back and disclose 20 years of employer information for his spouse. You know, I just want to add that Thomas says he's going to disclose this transaction now, but part of that transaction was the gift of free rent to his mother, and that too is disclosable as a gift to Justice Thomas, which he knows because he previously disclosed a gift of $5,000 cash for his grandnephew's education. So he understands that a gift can be given to someone else for you, and you have to disclose it as a gift. Michael Bachelos, darn you and your excellent tweeting, because it is one of the reasons that I find myself unable to leave Twitter. You tweeted in regards to Chief Justice John Roberts, you can't do zero about serious evidence of possible gross corruption by justices of the Supreme Court, and at the same time, complain that Americans don't have the high respect for the court that they used to. Talk to me about the risk as you see it if these calls for Chief Justice Roberts and the Justice Department to investigate Justice Thomas result in nothing. Well, uh, Alicia, as usual, you and I communicate. I was indeed talking about Chief Justice Roberts, not very subtly. You know, he, he's been watching this stuff. He knows what's going on. He's seen other possible allegations of corruption on the Supreme Court from the pay payment of Kavanaugh's debts to the withdrawal of Justice Kennedy for the, from the Supreme Court, whose son was a banker at Deutsche Bank with Donald Trump, all sorts of things like this, but nothing ever happens. And at the same time, Chief Justice Roberts, as nice a man as he is, gives these public speeches saying that he laments the decline in respect for the court. May I mention one historical thing, Alicia? Always. Uh, Abe Fortas was on the Supreme Court, LBJ appointee. 1969, he was forced to resign by his colleagues. Why? 
Number one, he took $20,000 from a crony with a promise of possibly taking more. But the other part of this is even more relevant to Thomas. Fortist was accused of being too close to the president, helping him too much secretly politically, even helping to write speeches. Well, Clarence Thomas is under serious allegations of his wife being involved in a coup d'etat, an insurrection against the United States on the 6th of January, possibly involved with her husband. The other string in this bow is not just financial, but this is someone who, if these allegations are true, has been much too close to President Trump and has violated the separation of powers. Congressman Bowman, as a New Yorker, safely ventured to the Manhattan courthouse after Trump called for death and destruction. What do you want to tell America about what it is Republicans are choosing to focus on? Republicans are self-destructing right in front of our eyes. They have no ideas. They cannot inspire anyone. So they play political stunts like the one you saw today. As you mentioned, New York is one of the safest, biggest cities in the country, whereas Jim Jordan's Ohio has all sorts of violent crime and gun crime taking place. Republicans continue to govern through fear and govern through intimidation as opposed to governing for the American people. The American people want to see something done about gun violence. The American people want to ensure that women have reproductive rights and the rights to bodily autonomy. The American people want to see us respond to climate change and the serious issues that are threatening our democracy and threatening humanity. That's what the American people want. But the Republicans continue to go down this path of fear of the border, fear of crime that doesn't exist, fear of China, and fear of all these other issues that they aren't even trying to deal directly with. And again, to quote your colleague, Mehdi Hassan, every accusation is a confession. So we have to pay very close attention to what the Republican Party is doing and do everything in our power to vote them out of office in both the Senate and the House so Democrats can get stuff done in 2024. Congressman Swole, I know you've seen Jim Jordan's shtick just up close on several committees. Have you ever seen him bring that same energy, that same outrage after a school shooting? Uh, no. Uh, in fact, uh, we have seen time after time uh, after school shootings, legislation brought forward uh, that would arm more killers uh, at the cost of our kids. Uh, now, good thing for Democrats, uh, Republicans aren't learning any lessons from uh, their crazy. They're just doubling down on it, as Jamal said. And in fact, we wouldn't have had to waste taxpayer dollars today uh, if Jim Jordan just stayed in his district. Uh, just to level set for your viewers, he represents a place called Mansfield, Ohio. It's the largest city in his district. Its nickname is Danger City because comparative, comparatively to Manhattan, it doesn't fare so well when it comes to public safety. So the guy from Danger City went to the Big Apple and fell squarely, flatly on his face. And, and they're going to keep doing this. So all we have to do, I think, as Democrats is continue to discredit uh, before any hearing starts, debunk any punches that they may try and land. And then, as Jamal said, pivot to what we can deliver on you know, like a woman's right to have an abortion and your kid's right to go home safely after school. Your reaction to that passage from the former Scalia clerk about the lack of standing, that the, that the hypothetical harm to the doctors somehow worse than the actual harm to millions of women. Well, I just love that you led with a Scalia clerk uh, quote. Uh, and I think it's so telling because beyond the obvious that uh, we believe that the women of this country should be able to make their own decisions about their health care with their doctors and their families and not politicians, this case goes to something pretty core. And that is the people that brought this case are a group that claims that this is some kind of stress for them, that this drug be out there that, as you point out, has been out in the market.
market for 23 years, a drug that was um, okayed after four years of consideration by the FDA, that is safe in 60 countries, and then suddenly these three judges, one in Amarillo, Texas, two on the Fifth Circuit, all Trump appointed, come out and say, hey, I don't really think it should be 10 weeks. We think it should be seven. We don't think you should be able to get it in the mail, and we don't think you should be able to get it in pharmacies. That's what happens. But do they have the standing, that's what we call it, to make one of those claims? And it was Justice Scalia himself, not exactly a radical, who in one case said that the mere fact that there may be a chance of someone being harmed is not enough to even get standing, that it makes a mockery of our prior cases, that at least someone has to have actual harm or the potential for harm. Look who's really going to be harmed here, Alicia. The women of this country. It is the drug used in over half of the abortions. The women that have to take a bus from Texas to Minnesota or from Florida with their six-week ban, Florida to New York. That's what's going to happen unless this court does the right thing. And I'm sure you had the same observation reading this ruling, which is it is in part Kaczmarek trying to make this pivot to fetal personhood, right? The real concern is not the life of the woman carrying that pregnancy. Their concern is purely beginning to push this argument that fetuses should have legal rights. I got to ask you, you got legal experts who think this ruling is so flawed, it's unlikely the Supreme Court's even going to back it. I I wonder how you see it playing out. Well, I think it goes back to what I just talked about on this uh, front of the standing front, because you literally can't have this one or now three judges be making a decision um, for women across the country. And we know we have another case out of Washington state, which covers my state of Minnesota, 17 states which allow abortion. They have said this is, this judge said no. The FDA was given this right. The FDA was given the right by Congress to make these kinds of decisions. You even have pharmaceutical companies coming out. You know why? And saying this this decision is wrong. The AMA, American Medical Association, making very clear that this drug is safe. Because what could this judge in Amarillo do next? Is he going to start saying, well, I don't like birth control. Mm -hmm. It really shouldn't be available to you. Or maybe another judge says Lipitor. I don't think that's safe. You cannot have that precedent when Congress gave FDA the right to make these kinds of decisions with their process, with medical advice, and based on the facts and the science. No matter what people's own personal religious beliefs are, and our country is rich with the diversity of religious beliefs, that's a good thing, you still have a delegation to the FDA when it comes to making decisions like this about drugs. Senator, you you brought up the six-week ban that Ron DeSantis signed into law in the state of Florida. Notable that in the political speeches he has been giving since he signed that into law, he's not mentioning it. Right. There has to be a part of them that knows that, you know, maybe paid attention during these past midterms that this is not actually a political winner for them. Well, I still remember, Alicia, some of my colleagues after Kansas, the day after Kansas, when that they had done everything to make that um, vote on the ballot hard to turn down. And here over 500,000 people turned out to vote against it, to stand up Democrats moderate Republicans, independents, to stand up against it. And we keep seeing that. We keep seeing it in what happened in the Alaska congressional race. Uh, We see it in what just happened in Wisconsin um, with a major, major margin uh, on their Supreme Court race. Uh, We are seeing it all over the country. That's where the people are. And that's why you don't see him emphasizing it. But you know what? It's hard to hide from that. He signed that into law.